Hello and welcome, everybody, to another episode, episode 37, of Last Week in Quantum. I'm your host, Bill Roth. This is the show where we review the week's news in the world of quantum and its impacts on the world of cybersecurity, AI, and more. And with us to discuss it is, as always, my sidekick, Brandon Dennis, Director of Operations at Secure. Welcome, Brandon. Thanks, Bill. And Elizabeth Green. SVP of Customers and Ecosystems at QSecure. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you very much. All right, let's begin. We've got three big articles today, and the first one comes from Inc. about how quantum computers could help hackers defeat encryption, and longtime listeners uh, of this show will know that. Uh, Brandon, take us through it. What does Inc. have to say? Pretty general article here out of Inc. Uh, The summary I pulled, many encryption algorithms in use today are based on techniques developed nearly 50 years ago. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, They've served us well, allowing people and businesses to send emails globally, shop online, move company data from the cloud confidently. It's going to change since researchers believe quantum computers capable of breaking today's encryption will arrive. Uh, Elizabeth, wanted to get your take. Could you share more about what the upgrade cycle looks like as we transition to post-quantum cryptography? Absolutely. And this will come as no surprise to any of you, but um, we've been working with old encryption. So they're saying 50 years. I sometimes say RSA was 30 years ago. But another thing you said, Brandon, in that article was data in motion. So data over the internet, data over a network. Those are the types of things that uh, are in trouble from quantum computers. That's the type of encryption that is uh, going to be impacted here. And I get this question all the time. What about the data that's sitting somewhere in our our mainframe or in our our data center? And that data is, is in pretty good shape. And the reason it's in pretty good shape is because it uses different types of encryption, um, typically uh, something like an AES standard. And that is not currently um, in in our lifetimes that we know of, and things change all the time, but that is not currently an encryption standard that we're expecting to be broken. So um, the encryption standards that are going to be broken are things like um, RSA. And we luckily now, as about three weeks ago, have a whole new set of post quantum algorithms that are available for use. One thing that NIST said when they released these post-quantum algorithms is, we think these are good for now, given what we know, uh, we should immediately start moving over and using these new algorithms. However, they're going to be changing. Those algorithms are not going to be a final set of algorithms. And what we're expecting to see is that over time, the algorithms are going to evolve different countries might have different uh, algorithms that they'd like to use. Uh, Quantum technology is going to continue to evolve and sometimes in ways that we can't yet predict. And so what we're expecting is we will have whole libraries of algorithms that are going to be used. So for now, we've got um, a handful of, of algorithms that get those into your your systems and and do it in a crypto ad crypto agile way is what i would say that way you can rotate in the algorithms now and you can start managing them in a way that allows you to easily upgrade them in the future so that you're not stuck in this you know although there's new ones we got to spend a couple of years doing this again get it all organized one time now use crypto agility put it in your environment and always forevermore have this continuous inventory at your disposal Yeah, in summary, folks, make sure you're ready for the upgrade cycle that's heading our ways. And Elizabeth talked about a number of great ways to do that. Quick reminder, folks, you can find the links to all the articles mentioned today in the show notes. And if you want weekly quantum updates, subscribe to our our YouTube channel and podcasts on Spotify, Apple, YouTube Music, and iHeartRadio. Stay up to date on the top news in quantum with Last Week in Quantum. Next up, we have uh, an article about Big Blue, Medium Blue, uh, IBM's big bet on quantum-centric supercomputer. Brandon, tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, absolutely. This one's diving into hybrid computing. So the quote I pulled, uh, today's quantum computers are now scientific tools capable of running programs beyond the brute force ability of classical simulation. We must continue to improve both our quantum and classical infrastructure so that combined, it's capable of speeding up solutions for problems relevant to humanity. Elizabeth, I'd like to hear kind of a 
a high level view of uh, have you explained hybrid computing to the audience? <laughs> so hybrid computing is actually, it sounds uh, difficult, but it's simple. It's just using more than one kind of computer to solve a challenge. And so uh, IBM, I, I love IBM. I spent 17 years there. I started my career there. And if you go to this article, actually, you see lots of pretty pictures about what these different types of computers look like. IBM was behind the supercomputers. Um, if you watch the, I can't remember the name of the movie, maybe you can find it for us, Bill, but Sending Man to the Moon was all about uh, IBM machines and they continue to evolve. And in fact, uh, IBM has now decided that quantum computers are at the space and evolution where they should create a whole new business division around quantum computing. So they're making quantum computing. They're also looking for ways to keep that safe. Um, the idea of hybrid computing means that even though quantum computers are going to do things, tasks that are amazing that we can't even fathom yet, they're not going to be replacing your household laptop. They're not even going to be replacing all of the supercomputers. There's going to be workloads that are really meant for quantum computers. And those workloads are going to be things that um, can't be done easily with a supercomputer. For example, we just talked about breaking these uh, complex algorithms, which are, are based um, just on, on factoring large strings of numbers. And supercomputers, surprisingly, can't do that. And that's why our encryption has been safe. Quantum computers, they'll be able to do that easily. There's some challenges with quantum computers, though. For one thing, they need to be really, really cold to operate. Um, they they have been talking about ways to run some of these components in space where it's cold, but it's, it's just not practical to use that type of computing power uh, for, for every instance. And so the idea here is use the right tool for the right job and quantum will be the right tool in some of these instances where you need a lot of processing uh, power. But also the cool thing about quantum computers is they don't work in a state of ones and zeros. They work in a state of ones and zeros and everything in between. So if you need to imagine the unimaginable, a combination of things that can't be seen in a state of ones and zeros, then you've got a case for supercomputing or for quantum computing more than supercomputing. And that's the hybrid story. Awesome. Next up, we have uh, an article from FedScoop, uh, breaking down the new NIST post-quantum cryptography standards with OMB's Nick Polk. I think this is a great article. And uh, I'm sure our ACE producer, Trina Mabunai, will actually toss in some of uh, QSecure's uh, NIST content. But Brandon, why don't you take us through what, uh, what the FedScoop uh, interview and the FedScoop radio uh, interview was all about? Yeah, I had the podcast on this morning in the background while I was doing some internal work. So Nick Polk, uh, who's the senior advisor on cybersecurity in the office of the federal CIO, uh, he came on the Daily Scoop podcast to break down the significance of the new post-quantum cryptography threats, how the White House is coordinating government and industry to take steps, and what else agencies should be thinking about regarding their cybersecurity in the future. Uh, Elizabeth, would love to get your take. Why do you think the federal government is putting so much effort into moving mm -hmm. to post-quantum cryptography? Well, it's, it's as simple as this. There are a lot of secrets um, in our government that can't get out. I mean, there are things like the positions of our troops. Uh, there are things like the um, names and, and uh, locations and family members of our soldiers. There is all kinds of sensitive uh, personal identifying information that the government has about its citizens. All of that stuff has to remain safe. and. It's not safe uh, with the advent of quantum computing. Uh, and we have a very short window to rectify that. And by very short window, it's, it's up in the air um, when that will be. It, some people say as early as three years. And you look at some of the advents that are happening and cooling quantum and quantum hardware and the things that are being developed every day. There are new announcements. And you think, wow, I hope it's not three years because we won't be ready. Um, there's a school of folks that say five years. There's a school of folks that say, okay, you've got the whole decade. And, and my concern and the government's concern too is if people say, okay, we have a whole decade to, to worry about this and they don't even start doing anything uh, until till the end of the decade, we're all really in a lot of trouble. And one of the reasons that we're in a lot of trouble is because 
we've been through an upgrade cycle of encryption before. Um, years ago, when we went to the RSA standard, 30 years ago, I think, um, it took on average five years to upgrade that technology. So my opinion and, and the opinion of the government is get started now, because if Q day, the day that quantum computers can factor these large numbers and break open our encryption comes in three years, we're in trouble. If it comes in five years, we're already late. If it comes in 10 years, there's limited resources around the world to be able to remediate the in motion encryption of the entire world, not just your business, your organization, the government, the governments around the world, the ecosystems that impact, that's a lot of work that has to happen. It's not optional. It has to happen. And the government is saying um, they're, they're mandating and they're they're putting money uh, at government organizations saying you have to start now. And they're strongly, strongly advising other organizations to do the same. Well, folks, you heard it here first. Q day. Uh, I think we're now going to start taking bets as to when that will happen. Uh, and if that uh, name doesn't uh, put chills down your spine, then you're not paying attention. I think more of this becomes important as well because as really the kind of international landscape is changing and we are moving, some would say, backward to an era of great power competition. And some of our uh, fellow countries are not necessarily... Uh, always friendly towards us and this becomes very very serious and another reason why the federal government uh, would want to pay attention to this for sure it can be weaponized against us and so it's time for us all to work together and make the world a little safer absolutely well that's all for today's show I'm your host Bill Roth and with us this week has been Brandon Dennis Director of Operations and Elizabeth Green SVP of Customers and Ecosystems at Q-Secure Thanks you, thank you to you both Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Bill. All right, folks, we'll see you next week on Last Week in Quantum.